Jose Mourinho is undoubtedly one of the greatest managers in the history of the sport. His excellent spells at Porto, Chelsea, Inter and Real Madrid saw him win every trophy possible and become recognised as a tactical mastermind. However, his recent spell at Tottenham Hotspurs has cast a lot of doubt on the Portuguese manager, with a lot of people questioning the relevancy of his tactics in the modern game. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the special one and asking ourselves if his tactics are really to blame for Spurs' recent downfall. The past few weeks have not been easy on Spurs fans. A 3-1 loss in the North London derby followed by a 3-2 aggregate defeat to Dynamo Zagreb have seen them crash out of the Europa League and put their Champions League hopes on ice. These results, however, seem to point to a bigger picture surrounding Jose Mourinho and what is being classified as his negative football. It's a term that's been used as a criticism of the Portuguese manager since his last season at Chelsea and his time at Manchester United. However, is it a sign of his inability to adapt to the modern game or is there more to blame? To understand this, let's take a look at what his strategies were during his most successful spells in his previous clubs. During his Champions League and title winning seasons, Mourinho's sides were characterised by an incredibly compact defence and creative attack. With Porto, the back four led by Ricardo Carvalho was fantastic at closing down the opposition and regaining possession. At Chelsea, John Terry was in his prime and one of the best defenders in the world, and during the 04-05 season, Chelsea only conceded 15 goals, a record that still stands to this day. At Inter Milan, a similar defensive solidity was found with Lucio and Samuel, while at Real Madrid, Sergio Ramos and Pepe can be considered as one of the best defensive partnerships in history. What made the defence so solid was a strong midfield screen in front of the back four, which would force the opposition to go out wide and not play down the middle. This role was epitomised by Chelsea's Claude Makélélé, one of the greatest CDMs ever and a perfect player to have in front of the back four. While Mourinho's formations varied from a 4-3-3 to a 4-4-2 diamond, the main principles of his tactics remained consistent, and essentially would consist of a strong defensive block which would allow the attacking players to flourish. And this offensive creativity is where Mourinho was able to achieve all his success. When on the back foot, his teams would often resemble a 4-1-4-1, with one target man to latch on to any long balls over the midfield. At Inter, it was Diego Milito, at Chelsea, it was Drogba, and at Real Madrid, it was Karim Benzema. All incredibly physical players able to hold up play or flick the ball onto the runners either side of them. The low defensive block would allow his attacking players to have space to move into and would rely on the creativity of his front block to break down the opposition. On long balls, the striker would find support from the attacking midfielder, who in all his teams was an excellent creative playmaker and could find the wingers overlapping. You could argue that Mourinho had at his disposal the best creative playmakers in all of world football. At Porto, he had Deco. At Chelsea, Lampard at Inter, Schneider, and at Real Madrid, Mesut Ozil. Mourinho was excellent at getting the playmaker to link defence and attack, offering a vertical passing option from the defensive centre mid. The wingers would also be constantly running in behind the opposition's back line, and were some of the more rapid and technical players in the team. Cristiano Ronaldo at Real Madrid, Eto'o at Inter, and Robin at Chelsea were all fantastic dribblers and finishers, and when in the final third, the front three would usually shift into a more narrow shape, which would often resemble that of a diamond with the centre attacking midfielder, and the width would be provided by usually one of the two fullbacks on the overlap. What made these Mourinho sides extremely dangerous was the speed at which they would operate during transitional phases. Both when losing the ball or regaining possession, the players were extremely well drilled and would regain their shape very rapidly. In essence, these Mourinho sides could be viewed as two different teams that worked extremely well together, usually five defensive-minded players and five attacking creative players. When looking at Mourinho's return to the Premier League, his last title was in 2015 with Chelsea, who adopted very similar tactics to what we've seen in his previous teams. A strong target man in Diego Costa, surrounded by creative players in Hazard, Fabregas, Oscar and William. However, his last spell at Man United was deemed unsuccessful not being able to bring Man United back to the glory days that they witnessed under Sir Alex Ferguson. But winning the Europa League and the League Cup is certainly not an underachievement, and that is to say he did it with a club that's certainly not the best in United's history, and was plagued by underperforming big name signings such as Alexis Sanchez and Paul Pogba. The reality is Mourinho actually brought plenty of tactical changes to his game in his time in Manchester. Firstly, the main idea behind his game plan remained relatively consistent with a strong target man in Romelu Lukaku surrounded by quick creative players in Mata and Martial. However, they were at times a lot less reliant on long balls, and were more keen in playing the ball out from the goalkeeper. When in their third, the CDM and Matic would drop between the back two, creating a defensive superiority and allowing the fullbacks to push up along the midfielders. 
By switching to a 3-4-3 when in possession, this created a lot of triangle and diamond shapes that allowed Man United to break down the high-pressing teams, which by 2018 was definitely the norm within the Premier League. And when off the ball, the team was also more eager to press high up the pitch. And although not as aggressive as Liverpool's high press, there was certainly more intensity when off the ball to win possession back. For all these tactical improvements that Mourinho had made, the main issue that the club was facing was finishing chances in front of goal, and as a result scored the least amount of goals than any team in the top four. This could be down to underperforming players, but was also more likely due to a lack of a strong defensive backbone for them to rely on. As we've seen in Mourinho's sides, a strong defensive support is at the core of any of their offensive power, and the aging partnership of Smalling and Jones was too prone to mistakes and wasn't able to turn over possession as frequently as Mourinho would have liked. But the Europa League success was a sign that Jose Mourinho's tactics were not done yet, and he was deemed a suitable replacement for Mauricio Pochettino at Tottenham. His first season in charge saw him finish in 6th place, and stabilise the ship after the premature exit of Mauricio Pochettino. However, the true test for Jose Mourinho was the current season, and top 4 was deemed the target the team had to reach. Currently in 6th place and only 3 points of 4th place Chelsea, there's definitely still a chance for Spurs to qualify for the Champions League. However, with teams ahead of them seemingly in better form, such as Chelsea and West Ham, they're definitely facing an uphill battle. First, let's take a look at what tactical changes Mourinho has made in his time as Spurs. At Spurs, Mourinho's most used formation is the 4-2-3-1. It's a slight variation of his previous 4-3-3 or 4-4-2 diamond midfield and is seen as more of a shift into modern tactics. With a double defensive pivot, it allows his fullbacks to push up, and the centre attacking midfielder Ndombele is usually the target man between the lines. But the true story of Tottenham's season is the incredible partnership of Son and Kane, with the duo setting a Premier League record for the most combined goals in a single season. This kind of positional rotation that sees Son switch to the front and Harry Kane switch to the left of attacking midfield has become a prominent feature of Tottenham's ability to disrupt the opposition's defence and is the epitome of Mourinho's principles of a creative attack that can find space and exploit the opposition. However, the main issues that Spurs are facing right now aren't necessarily their attacking or defensive tactics, but rather the defensive and cautious approach that the team has adopted in their recent fixtures. Having two CDMs is an excellent way of stopping the opposition from moving up the pitch. However, when regaining possession in the final third, there are fewer outlets high up the pitch for Spurs to move into. Given there is only one more advanced midfielder, it's relatively straightforward for the opposition to close him down and block any passing lanes into Kane or Son, making them a lot less lethal on counter-attacks, which is an essential part of Mourinho's play. In teams such as Chelsea's 2015 season, which also played with the 4-2-3-1, this was compromised by having a more box-to-box -box midfielder in Fabregas, able to support the front four and ease transitional phases. But with Spurs, the partnership of Hoiberg and Sissoko may lack the dynamism and attacking mentality required to transition rapidly. So we've seen how Mourinho has in fact changed his tactics to suit the needs of the modern game, often deploying a back three to counter the high press and more use of attacking fullbacks. So what is the reason as to why Mourinho is struggling to compete with some of the top managers in the modern game? Well, if we examine why Mourinho dominated world football for years, a lot of his advantages came from his unique training techniques and methods. In fact, Mourinho became famous for his reliance on sports science and psychology, and is arguably the best known manager for the implementation of tactical periodization. Tactical periodization is a training methodology where the tactical part of the sport encompasses three dimensions of technical, physical and psychological elements. Football in nature is a chaotic sport, and the whole purpose of training is to help players understand the main principles that the team is going to implement during the match. Jose Mourinho was excellent at creating specific training methods in a way that didn't lose the inherent chaos of football, but would focus on specific subsets of the team. For example, one training session would focus on the defensive block, while another would focus on the attack, another on the midfield, and another on the flanks. By doing this, each player can grow comfortable in their specific roles, and understand what needs to be done when faced with a problem during the game. Given the success that Mourinho achieved with these tactical principles, it naturally led to more and more teams adopting tactical periodization within their teams, to the extent that now this is the norm with any professional football club. Jose Mourinho could be considered as a sort of pioneer in the sport given his reliance on sports science and sports psychology. However, in the modern game, any professional team has at their disposal these resources, and so the main issue surrounding Mourinho in these previous seasons aren't necessarily his tactics, but the idea that his training methods are no longer unique. And so, while Mourinho may still have a place in the modern game, he can no longer be considered as the special one. What do you think of Jose Mourinho, and what do you think of his tactics? 
Leave your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you like this type of video, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.